So why write this book? There's a lot of regularity in the way that people are organized and how that influences their outcomes. And in the book, I sort of intertwine two different themes. One is that our networks have special features, and those features are, are simple and quantifiable. And the second is that they have impacts on our lives. And you know, the sort of topics I include and, and discuss are things like influence, how people are influenced, how, how do you define influential people, and how does it depend on the context? Um, how, what kind of biases do we have in forming opinions and beliefs? Um, things like contagion and how financial contagions are different from a, a flu contagion. Things like um, you know, how splits in, in our networks feed uh, polarization, feed inequality, feed immobility, and then how patterns are changing over time. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just go through a few illustrative examples. And what I want to start with is just uh, <clears throat> sort of a simple picture. And what I'm going to do is show you a, a series of pictures. The first picture is one of a fictional high school, and then I'm going to show you a real high school. And what I want to do is contrast the two, and then you'll be able to see the patterns that typically emerge. So the high school I'm going to show you is one from what's known as the Ad Health data set. And that data set is a, is a, a, a series of uh, looks at high schools and how, they, how people's friendships form and what patterns they take. And so what I've done here is I've created a fictional network which is exactly the same as the high school in terms of the number of students and the number of friendships. But I randomly placed the friendships instead of putting them in the, in the structure that they appear in a high school. And so what I want to do is just contrast that. So here, it just sort of looks like a spaghetti bowl, right? There's a bunch of students that are connected, and you don't see any patterns. And now I'm going to show you a real high school. So this is a real high school from the, same, <clears throat> from a, the Ed Health data set, 255 students. And now you'll notice that there's some patterns that emerge. And just in terms of contrast, here, everybody has friends, right? So there's no isolated nodes. When you get to this one, um, there are some isolated nodes. So there's some, some students who don't have close friendships. And these were defined by, by people who s did at least three different activities in a given time period with each other. The other thing is that I had an algorithm that drew this picture. So you'll notice that there's sort of a split between the top of the picture and the bottom of the picture. The top of the picture, you have connections in a group, and the bottom of the picture has connections in a group. And there's not many connections across the two groups. So there's sort of a, a split in this graph. And the algorithm that drew this, what it does is it doesn't know where to place things. It just looks and it, it picks two nodes. And if they're connected, pulls them closer together. If they're not connected, pushes them further apart. And it just does this until you stop it. And so it, it goes and it tries to find the community patterns in the network. Now what I'm going to do is take this and color it. And what I'm doing now is coloring it by race. So the blue nodes are, are black students. The yellow nodes are white students. The red nodes are Hispanic students. And now you'll begin to notice that there's strong segregation patterns in this network. Basically, there's only, I think, three strong friendships um, between blacks and whites in, this whole, in, in the whole high school. And you'll see that it, you know, it's, it, it's strongly segregated across racial lines. And that's even despite the fact that this high school looks well, well integrated in terms of the composition of the high school. So you've got a high school where you think is well integrated, but if you look internally, it's completely segregated. Here's another picture just to give you. This is another high school, but now it's color coded by gender. And the links are actually uh, romantic or sexual relationships during uh, an 18 month period of, the, of the, the study. And here you'll notice also in like the 63 and the 2 and the uh, 12, 9, those are numbers of how many times that subgraph appears. So there's a, a 63 pairs that didn't connect with anybody else. But you'll notice on the left, there's a giant component, what it's called. So this is a component where basically you could draw a path from any node in that to any other node. So even though each person has few relationships, you're able to actually trace from one to another. And that means you know, when, you're, when you're looking at things like um, uh, disease spread and things, or even rumor spread, other kinds of things, Understanding this component structure of the network can be very important in understanding uh, how things spread. So in, in going back to this idea that there's <clears throat> a, a difference between these networks and, and random networks, one thing that's true is you end up having some nodes that have very many connections and some that have very few connections. 
and essentially what's known as sort of fat tails in the distribution. So when you look at the distribution of friendships, you see more people who have very few and more people who have very many connections than you would normally see just at random. And um, this has some impact. And, and one thing I want to start with is just talking about what's known as the friendship paradox. And this is something that we're all constantly uh, bombarded by, essentially. And, and it's the fact that our friends are more popular than we are. And that sounds like a sort of strange thing. How can it be that your friends are all more popular than you are? Um, on average, people's friends tend to be more popular than they are. And why is that true? When you, when you look at somebody who has, say, 20 friends and somebody who has two friends, the person who has 20 friends is going to appear in a lot of people's friendship counts. So people who have the most friendships appear as friends to, to the most people. And so our, our samples of friends are not random samples from the population. They tend to be heavily biased towards the people who are the most popular. And that ends up having consequences. So if these people act differently than the rest of the population, then you end up having a, a distortion in terms of when you look at your friends and what their behaviors look like. And if you project that to the rest of the population, it's not a random sample. And um, you know, it, in social media, have sort of accelerated this effect or, or amplified it. So if you look at, say, Twitter, um, typically the uh, uh, follower has 10 times fewer followers than the pe people that they're following. Uh, so, so you know, there it gets even more extreme. But the, you know, to, to understand sort of the illustration of this, if you look in middle school, each additional friend that a kid has makes them 6% um, more likely to have tried alcohol by the time they become a teenager, and 5% more likely to have smoked by the time they become a teenager. So basically, the kids who are the most popular are ones who tend to um, be trying things at earlier ages. And that also goes, there's a whole series of studies on drugs. And they tend to be experimenting at earlier ages. And then the students who are friends with them are, are seeing their behaviors and projecting that often to the rest of the population. So people systematically overestimate the amount of consumption of drugs, alcohol, smoking that goes on in a population in, in schools um, because they're being overexposed to people who are, are, are following those behaviors. Um, so that, that ends up having a, an impact in terms of, of you know, what people see. There's also something that's very true in, in both in social networks that are purely social, if you're just talking about friends that you're meeting physically or online. And that's a, a rich get richer phenomenon. So when you begin to look at, at uh, how you find friends, often you meet people through people you already know. You meet customers. If you're in a business, you meet customers through your existing customers. And the fact that this happens means that the more opportunities you have to meet people, the easier it is to meet people, and that snowballs. And so you see this acceleration in terms of some people end up with very many connections. Other people end up with very few connections. And that happens through all sorts of media. You know, you can look at, at, at videos, whether they go viral or not, and look at the quality of them. And there can be very high quality ones that don't and, and other ones that do. And, and that has this kind of feedback effect. And so in networks, you get this kinds of, of exacerbated um, inequality in terms of social connections. And those social connections have consequences. Now, going back to, the, to this other segregation pattern that we see. Um, let me take you through a, a couple of examples of this. So this is another example from a study we did um, in India. And now I, what I've done is, is uh, coded things by caste. So this is an Indian village. These are connections between households. And a connection between household is usually that they're borrowing and lending money, kerosene, rice. Um, they're giving each other medical help. So this is a poor village, and they're basically helping each other out. And the, the caste designation here, the red nodes, are the relatively disadvantaged castes. So these are scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So these are the ones that are recognized by the Indian government for affirmative action. And the other, um, the squares, the, the blue squares, are the relatively advantaged castes. And these villages, they're not very advantaged, but um, they're, they're considered uh, to, to be better off by the government than, uh, than the other ones. So those are the otherwise backward castes and uh, general merit. <clears throat> and you know, here you can begin to see that, again, you're 15 times more likely to be connected with somebody in your own caste than across caste. So it, these are strong boundaries. And you can also see 
even among the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, there are strong cuts. And these cut both on religion, so Muslim and Hindu don't interact much in these villages, and also, for instance, the, the Dalit, um, the, the uh, untouchable caste, are often uh, their own group and, and don't communicate with other groups. And so you can go into a village. We were going into these villages to try and spread microfinance information. And it turns out that if you hit one of these groups and you don't hit multiple groups, you basically don't get the information out. So it's really important. You know, these are, they're very insular. So even if it's a village of 200 households, you think everybody must know each other. They've lived there their whole lives. 200 households, how can they not be communicating? They can really be quite segregated and, and quite introspective, even though they're in close proximity and, and in this kind of, of setting um, with lots of other individuals that have differences, but they just don't really communicate. When you get back to, the, to sort of this, the high school, uh, you, you end up you know, having impact on whether people go to college. We're doing a study now where we're trying to understand decisions to go to college and how, how those are peer affected. And again, you're mostly influenced by your close friends. And even getting basic information about how to study for SATs or how to apply to colleges or what kind of financial aid is available, all kinds of things that seem fairly simple uh, can be something that's very alien to certain groups internally. And as, as people grow up, it gets even uh, more pronounced in the sense that when you look at access to jobs, um, roughly 50 to 70 percent of jobs are uh, originally obtained through referrals, meaning you know somebody at the company, they help get you an interview, and if you don't have that interview, it's very difficult to get looked at. And um, what that does is it sort of exacerbates this uh, persistent inequality in the sense that if I'm in a group that where very few of my friends are employed, and they have low wages, it's very difficult for me to get information about jobs, to get contacts, and to actually get jobs. And so then I have more incentives to drop out of the labor force. I have less incentives to invest in education. Um, and and you know, this sort of goes along <clears throat> over, over time. There's a, a really interesting study by Ron Lashever. And he was trying, so this is very difficult to tease out. When you're doing research on this, it's very difficult to tell why you know, if, if two people are connected and neither of them are getting a job, it's very difficult to tell whether there's a, an effect from one to the other. Because it could be that these are people who just are unemployed, and unemployed people tend to be friends with each other, and employed people tend to be friends with each other. So what he did is he took advantage of a, of a random assignment of people to friend groups. And the way he did it was he looked at the um, draft in the First World War. So in the First World War, the U.S. Army went from about three or 400,000 people in 1917 to almost 4 million people enlisted by 1918. So it was an enormous growth in a very short period of time. And the way they did this was a random draft. You got drafted, and then people were put into communities of uh, companies of 100 people. So you were just thrown into these people uh, with, with other people, and it was done completely randomly, just by the order of your number that you got uh, it, were drafted in. And then these people literally spent you know, a couple of years in the trenches with each other. So they became very close friends. And then what he does is he follows their employment trajectories after, after the war, through the 1930s. And when you look at somebody in my company, if, if somebody in my company, um, if, if there's a 10% increase in the employment rate in my company, that corresponded to a 4% increase in my employment in, on, on, on average. So basically, you're getting about a 40% spillover of your friend's employment to your own employment just by ran completely random assignment of friends. So it gives you an idea that this is, can be a powerful force in terms of whether or not people have access to jobs. And it gives you an idea that you know, whether, when you're looking at, at groups that are relatively disadvantaged, it, it's very difficult to get out of that because they don't have the opportunity access that other people, uh, other people do. Um, one of the most... I think impressive studies in quantifying these effects was what's known as the Moving to Opportunity Study. I don't know if people know that. So this was a study that was done by the US government in the 1990s. And what they did was they gave different families vouchers. They gave them vouchers. And what was a voucher good for? The, the voucher would pay your rent. So they were giving low-income families vouchers to pay for rent. And they, did, they, they broke, they had about 4,500 households, a little more than 4,500. And they broke them into three groups. A third of them, they gave vouchers, and they could just pay for their rent. 
A third of them, they, did, they, they gave nothing just to, as a control group. And a third of them, they gave vouchers, but only if they agreed to move to a wealthier neighborhood. So they had to move, and they had to move to a neighborhood that was um, higher up in the income distribution. And what they found was if your family, so now you can look back at this and, and sort of see what the outcome was. And if you moved a, a, a family that moved with an eight-year-old child from the, a poor location to a wealthier location, now the, um, the eight-year-old child, in terms of lifetime income, looks like they're about $300,000 uh, higher in terms of lifetime income. Um, they're a sixth more likely to have gone to college. They're less likely to be single parents. They're less likely to be incarcerated. They have better health outcomes. So you know, essentially taking them out of one community, putting them into another community, made a big difference in what the, who their peers were, what the, the parental peers were, and then what their life was like as, as a result of this. Now, obviously, social engineering is not an easy thing to do. We don't want to start you know, just going around and trying to rewire everybody's networks. But what that does tell us is that these things can have a, a, a very large impact. And interestingly, the, the impact depended on how old the kids were. So an eight-year-old kid got a huge impact. An 18-year-old kid had almost no impact. So if you took an 18-year-old, they basically had already had their social network and a lot of the you know, uh, impact on them. And it really made very little difference in terms of, of um, outcomes. I spend more time in the book also talking about uh, learning and, and how people learn information through networks. And I think now with, with all the discussion of fake news and, and polarization and echo chambers, there's a lot we can actually learn from the basic network structures in terms of the kinds of biases that operate. And um, you know, one, there's sort of a fascinating study that goes way back, which is uh, known as vox populi. I don't know if people know the term. Um, it's the wisdom of the crowds. And this was a, a guy named Sir Francis Galton. And he published a paper in, in, a, in the journal Nature in 1907. And what it did was he went to a, um, a fair in England. And it was a fair where you could guess the weight of an ox. So there was an ox there. The ox weighed uh, 1,198 pounds. And then for a, a fee, you could, you could guess the weight of the ox. And then whoever got closest to the, to the actual weight um, won a prize. And what he did is he collected all the guesses. And there were 787 guesses. And the average guess in the population was 1,197 pounds. So it was one pound short of the actual weight of the ox. And the median was actually just over 1,200 pounds. So it was just, you know, basically there were the, the, the middle of this distribution was just centered right on the actual weight. And then there was a, a, you know, a, quite a variance on it. But what that tells you is that collectively, if everybody could share their information, often you can come to the right kind of decision or the right kind of knowledge about some facts. Um, but then we're su subject to all kinds of issues in terms of the biases that we face. So as we see in these kinds of networks, we, we're not necessarily listening to everybody equally. So if there's biases in terms of what kinds of information people have, depending on ethnicity, age, gender, profession, et cetera, then those things, if we're only talking to those people, we don't get nearly the, the information to, um, to aggregate up to, to come to the wisdom of the crowd. And so you know, that, that's a, a difficult thing. And, and also, uh, you know, humans are, are very good at counting. So you know, if you think about the information you hear, so suppose there's a new movie out. Um, and you hear from seven of your friends that this is you know, a movie you have to go to. They've just heard it's really wonderful. Uh, you count that implicitly. The more people you hear that from, the more you begin to believe it. But it could be that all those people read the same review. right? So it could be that all of that is traced back to one source. And when you're looking at these kinds of networks, it's very easy for you to be being bombarded by information which is all coming from the same source and then repeating it. And these kinds of echo chambers um, do lead to, to um, false beliefs in, in, in a variety of settings. So what I want to do to, to just um, you know, sort of uh, talk a little bit about the trends in networks. And what I'm going to do here is take you through a couple of pictures of, of how things have been changing over time. And it's actually difficult to find pictures of networks that go far back. 
So what I've done here is this is from a study I did with, with uh, Stephen Nye. And this goes all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars. And now what we're looking at is connections between countries. So these are countries. And a, a, a link between two of them is that they had a, a military alliance. So either a positive um, a, a alliance that they agreed to be allies in some confrontation, or they agreed not to attack each other. So what we'll start is, is just by looking at, at these things over time and seeing how they're changing. So right after the Napoleonic Wars, we had a, a group that were sort of connected. Um, they lasted together for a while. You keep going. Things are bouncing around a little bit. 1870s were a pretty rough period. Um, you start get, you know, the unification of Germany happened just after this. Otto von Bismarck appears in the 1870s. Then you start seeing new connections. Um, you get to just before the First World War. 1920s were a rough period. Uh, 1930s, you begin to see things take place. And now, when you look post-1950, you'll see very different patterns emerging. So here, things are getting a lot denser. Um, and by the time you get to 2000, you see an incredibly dense network. And the network now, you, know, you can sort of place your favorite country in this network. There's two different features before 1950 and after 1950. Before 1950, people tended to have about two and a half allies, so many fewer. And the chance that they lasted for five years was about two thirds. So if you look at an alliance, look five years later, the chance it survives was about two thirds. Now people have about 10 and a half uh, allies, and the chance that it lasts is about 95%. So there's a much higher chance that it lasts. And if you begin to look at this network, I don't have the pictures for the trade networks going over this time period, but they really closely overlap with trade. And so a lot of it is cemented by trade. And the international, the globalization that's been going on in terms of trade networks, both um, directly in terms of goods and financial networks, really are what cement these and mean that that's why they don't, they don't disappear and why it's becoming increasingly dense. Um, the good news about this is that when you look at the incidence of wars over time, Basically, once this network has started densifying, the wars have pretty much disappeared uh, by historical standards. So even though we still have wars, most of the big wars in the past few decades have actually been in Africa. Um, but if you look at sort of the, you know, the history of what's still going on, we have about one-tenth the frequency of wars post-1950 as we had before 1950. So it's actually a much pe more peaceful period than people realize. And um, you know, there's different ways of measuring it. This is off of a data set that we used, which was called the Correlates of War data set. But basically, things are becoming much more peaceful. And that that's really has an enormous amount to do with trade. If you throw nuclear weapons into the mix, you really can't explain the patterns of wars. Um, the patterns of wars really seem to be explained by the trade. And when you look at the same, this is just world trade as a percentage of GDP, it's just been going up steadily. So you know, the, the world trade network has been growing denser. That's cementing relationships and actually leading to a lot of peace. And when you look at the remaining conflicts in the, in the world, you know, for instance, if you look at um, what's going on in the Middle East, Israel is surrounded by countries that it doesn't trade with. So Jordan is the only country that it has any trade with. And I think Jordan ranks 20th on its uh, list of trade partners. Um, when you look at uh, North Korea, it's fairly isolated in terms of trade. When you look at U.S. Tra uh, trade with Russia, it, it's actually a low trade, relatively low trade um, uh, dyad um, given the, the amount of the size of the two economies. So, you know, just understanding that I think gives us a lens into sort of how these networks are changing over time. Um, and it's an important thing in, in light of Brexit and a whole series of other things. You don't want to be too alarmist, but sort of, you know, anything that moves trade in, backwards is, is sort of moving us in the wrong direction in, in, this, in terms of the networks. What I wanted to end with is just a question of whether the world's actually becoming more polarized. And I think, um, before I show you the full pictures here, I want to say a, a couple of things about that. So one is, and, and this is something that people at Google know well, is that algorithms are important in determining what people have access to and, and how they connect to, uh, to other people. And one thing that's happening over time is you know, our world's becoming denser in terms of the connection, so we can maintain relationships at a much greater distance. But we also have search engines. I mean, the, the system is so difficult to navigate that you need some way of finding things and finding people. 
And one thing that that allows us to do is find other people who actually have very similar interests to us or like things and find things that we can like and have the um, systems show those to us. And so that sort of plays off of this homophily, this segregation in networks that is so prevalent. Our, our natural tendencies to look for things that, that are, are similar to ourselves gets um, amplified by this. And so there's been some discussion about whether the world's more polarized. This is a picture from Senate co-voting. And here what each dot is is a senator. And this is from the 1990 Senate. And this is from code I got from Renzo Lucioni, um, who's a computer scientist. And all, it, all I did was look at the 1990 Senate, look at all the votes that happened, and we'll put two um, senators together if they voted the same way more than half the time. So if they agreed more than they disagreed, we'll put a link between them. So it just shows sort of how cohesive is the Senate in terms of co-voting patterns. Are people agreeing, not agreeing? And again, you know, the, the algorithm doesn't know the colors of the nodes. It puts them on the page by, by putting people together that, that co-vote similarly and pulling them apart if they're not. And so it, it gives us a picture. And what you can see, this is 2015. So the question of whether the, the, the voting is becoming more polarized, you can just see the, you know, I didn't pull this apart. Um, the algorithm does that. So now the, the chance that you co-vote with somebody, before it was 82%, so here, 82% of the senators were linked to each other. Now it's 53%. And most of them tend to be within th their own party. So very few of the connections go across parties. And you, you can fill in who, where your favorite senator is and, and so forth. Um, interestingly, some of the Republican, like Rubio and Cruz and Graham, end up at very different points and, and very different. So you can begin to you know, uh, place people on a political spectrum partly by who they're co-voting with. But what this does say is that some of these, the, the idea is that, that there's more tension and, and less agreement um, is, is partly true. It's a little difficult with the Senate stuff because you know, the, what is actually being voted on is changing over time as well. And so um, it's, it's not a, 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 there's other things going on at the same time. But you, you begin to see that there's definitely a pattern here. Uh, <clears throat> you know, other kinds of things. It took four years for the plague to go from Marseille to Stockholm. It took a week from Ebola to get from, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, fr from Africa to, to New York. Um, so, so, you know, the, the world's becoming more connected. That's great in a lot of ways. So the, the globalization we showed you is leading to a lot of peace. We see people being able to be connected that they weren't connected before. The world poverty rate has come down from over 40% to um, less than 10%. Uh, in the, since 1980. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of great news in terms of all these connections. But at the same time, I think the, the fact that we're becoming more connected, we can become more connected and actually more segregated at the same time. And you're seeing both of those effects happening. And it's an interesting uh, time to, to sort of be studying networks for, for, for that reason. I think that's a good time to, to sort of stop and ask for your questions and uh, comments. Thanks. I was wondering for your better off, worse off group scenario, um, if we establish enough like connection between the groups, if one group can assimilate the other. Yeah, I think uh, so, so. So sort of being aware of the homophily and the segregation across groups is helps us understand. Look, the, there's not necessarily information and opportunities flowing to these groups. Part of the difficulty in just establishing links across the groups is that you need to put a lot of links in there if you want to do things that are sort of peer influenced. So if you look inside the high schools, uh, we've been doing studies on, on um, you know, alcohol consumption and drug consumption and, and things. And if you look at those, um, a rough rule of thumb is that the students sort of act like the majority of their friends. And that means that if you've got these sort of segregation patterns, you'd have to put in an enormous number of connections to really um, correct for the fact that they're very segmented. So it's not an easy thing to overcome. And I think that you know, some things that can be done are mentoring programs, especially when it gets to getting people into college. So if it's hard to build many relationships, instead you can build really strong ones. So put somebody in who can actually go into a student, and instead of just you know, sending them information, say, OK, look, here's a mentor. Here's somebody who went to college. Here, they can tell you about what you need to do to apply, how you're, what your life is going to be like, and, and you know, spend concentrated time with them. Uh, I think that that's very important. I was just wondering um, how the 
techniques of studying things like this, sociological networks or economics, has changed with you know advances yeah. in technology and uh, availability of data and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it, it, it's really a fun time to be doing this because the data are, are exploding in terms of the, <clears throat> the a number of, of number and richness of data sets is, is really uh, e extraordinary now. And there, there are a lot more techniques that we have for working with large data sets. So the ones I've shown you are ones that can be visualized, which are usually smaller. But you, know, you can handle ones with hundreds of millions of nodes. And, and uh, we're actually doing that with some um, various media platforms and trying to understand how people are connecting and what the implications are. So large data sets are becoming available. And, Often, a lot of the, like when I showed you the Indian village data, those were ones we obtained by surveys. And when you ask people for who their friends are and so forth, you know, that you get biases and you get measurement error. You can't remember all your friends, you don't name all the people and so forth. When you actually look at, at other kinds of footprints, especially electronic footprints, you get a, a different picture of what's going on. You don't necessarily see all of the communication, but you get, you know, it's hard for people to forget what's, what's actually going on online. And so mixing these two things together, you actually get different pictures of, of how people are communicating. And so I, I think the richness of the data and, um, you know, the understanding that it actually matters both in terms of immobility, inequality, polarization, these kinds of issues mean that it's becoming, it's, a, it's an area of study that's ex sort of exploding. Uh, especially in, for an economist, it's happening in labor economics, it's happening in development economics, where people are trying to figure out how to help people. Um, and then it's happening in computer science. Um, and, and now there's more and more realization that the algorithms matter. And you know, thinking of an algorithm not just for how it's going to affect a certain person, but how it's going to affect a group is a different issue. And so I, I think it's a, it's a really wonderful time to be thinking about this. You were talking about the rent voucher study. Yeah. Um, and you were saying that there were three different groups. There was the control, yeah. just getting everyone got vouchers, and then they got vouchers if they moved. Um, you were talking about uh, better outcomes for the people who moved and got vouchers. Right, right. Um, was that were, were those better outcomes with um, with respect to the control or with respect to yeah. the people who got vouchers but didn't move? And also, how did the people who got vouchers but didn't move do with respect to the control? Right, right. Good, very good question. So the, the, the comparison I gave for the $300,000 was between the group that got vouchers and moved and then the control group. And then when you look within the group that got vouchers but didn't have to move, the people who actually chose to move ended up looking like the, um, the group that had to move. And the people who didn't move looked slightly better than the control group, but not much. So I think for an eight-year-old, it, it would be more on the order of like $20,000 you know, as opposed to $300,000. So it was, it was a small effect for the people who got the vouchers but didn't move. Um, and it depended. Yeah, some of those groups actually, they moved, and it made a huge difference for them. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Another question that's kind of related to what I was asking before is um, um, how the practice of economics has changed You know, with the um, change of technologies. I don't imagine people were doing network science and economics, you know, 30 years ago yeah, or something. Yeah. Um, and also, what developments in other fields have been adopted to success in um, economics? Like, I recognize some of these things from statistical physics, like right, right. looking at the degree distribution, following a power law, mm -hmm. um, looking like this. But um, I'm just wondering if there's, you know, much of an impact from other fields of basic science in, in uh, um, economics and how it's changed for people. A oh, great question. Yeah. So I think that you know I, I think of it as <clears throat> classic economics studied thought about markets in an anonymous way. <clears throat> so the, you had people who processed information, made choices, weighed costs and benefits, and a lot of the basic economics was driven by that. And I, I think of it as there's been two influences that have. Uh, have a chance to, to make a big difference in understanding a lot of these things. One is social structure and, and networks. And the other, which brings in from a different angle, is sort of what's known as behavioral economics, which um, is getting a lot of, of play these days, where you, know, you look at psychological biases that people have, overconfidence or um, procrastination, other kinds of things, and then try and understand how that plays into decision making and how that systematically biases things. So I think you know you can think about it as 
uh, people were thinking of fully rational people was sort of the classic setting where not only were people able to process all their information, but they had all the information that was out there. And, and this gives you more of a feeling for, look, people are constrained by their opportunities, they're constrained by their, their information sets, and they also have behavioral biases that, they, you know, for instance, in, in our studies, when we look at these, um, when I talked about this, what's known as correlation neglect, the fact that I get seven friends who tell me something and I treat that as seven independent observations, it turns out that they're all correlated, they all heard it from the same person, that's something which is both psychological and influenced by the network. And it's something that you can measure. So if you were, if you were a, a good Bayesian and you understood how these networks worked, you could sort of undo that, right? And, and you could say, okay, well, there's actually a chance that I'm hearing this indirectly. And it, just in my own thinking, I think I am very different in the way I act now because of, of studying networks. So one is when people tell me something, I ask them where they heard that from, where did the information come from? And then I also try to, to you know, reach out across groups. So I go to sociology conferences, I go to computer science conferences, I go to statistical physics conferences to try and re, you know, find new ideas and information that I wouldn't be getting just from economists. And I think you know, mo the more social sciences can do that, the better off we'll be. It seems like a lot of the interesting observations uh, are kind of generated by this idea that there are natural like clusters within the um, graph here. And um, so I was wondering if you have good formalized ways of thinking about this. Like I've seen ideas like min normalized cut and whatnot, yeah, but yeah. are very hard to actually compute. And yeah. I was wondering if you had like a good formalized way of thinking about clusters and whether that's the terms in which you think about these things. Right, right, right. Uh, so, so there's an area of, of network science which is called community detection. And the idea is, you know, as, as you're mentioning, you, you put down a graph and then you try and find the cuts. So here it's not too hard to see where the cut is, right? It's sort of right in the middle. Um, but in, in these more complicated areas, how much do I dissect a, a network? How, 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 how do I divide it up into groups? And I actually have a, a paper I just wrote with a student at, at Stanford. And what we do is say, well, you know, and, and a lot of it works just off of graph structure. So you can look at, at what's known as the, the spectrum of the graph or other kinds of things and then use those to try and split the graph up. There's a lot of different ways to do it. But what we did instead was say, well, if, if we're trying to do an economic application with it, then we want to ask, uh, how would people behave on this graph? And let's build the communities out of the behaviors that they would induce. So instead, you, you actually say, for instance, let's suppose I have a, a, a high school and most of the kids are going to act like they're the majority of their friends. How does that split up a graph? Which groups will act, end up acting like each other um, consistently? Um, but none of this turns out to be easy to compute. So all of it in large graphs has to be done by some kind of a, these are all NP complete or NP hard problems, and so you have no choice but to somehow use an algorithm that's going to do an approximation. But in a lot of graphs, there's ways to, to sort of do it that I think gives you sensible outcomes. Um, and they can help. You know, we're, we're doing work actually in India now where we're trying to um, get increase in vaccination uptake. So we're going into villages and we're trying to reach people and we're trying to figure out how to reach them. And, and part of that involves figuring out this structure and then figuring out how to target people inside different groups and make sure that they're all hearing about the, the programs. Just, just to follow up on that last comment, I was curious what, what heuristics or tests you could do to probe a population to determine those clusters without having the graph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a really tricky thing is, is, you know, here I've been showing you graphs where, you know, we actually have all the information. And um, one study we did, so it turns out there, there's two things that are true about people and what their knowledge of graphs, the, the graph around them is. First of all, suppose you just ask, I ask you to name your friends. Well, that's something you can do. But now if I ask you to name the other people who, at, at, in this Google um, cluster that are, are friends with each other, it turns out people are slightly better than coin flips at doing that, but not great. Um, so, so actually knowing who else is really friends with whom and who's talking to whom is, is not so easy. And so it's very difficult to actually ask people to reconstruct the graph. But 
you, it, it turns out that people are very good at naming who's central in the graph. So if I asked you, and central not just in terms of popular, but central in terms of, of actually Google page rank, um, page rank and back rub and other um, notions of you're popular, you're not just popular, but you're actually well connected to other well connected people who can, can be influential. And if you ask people who are the influential people, you can actually get very good answers. And um, building off of that, it's able to, you're able to do some statistical reconstruction of a graph. You can't reconstruct the graph perfectly, but you can get some ideas of at least who the key individuals are and which groups don't connect with each other. So there's techniques of doing that, and I, I'd be happy to share references with you, but it's, it's sort of a, just a growing area. It's starting to grow right now in, in, in study. Yeah. So I was uh, wondering, in the example you showed before of the graph of uh, uh, social connections in the village in India, where they have these um, you know, click-like things in the graph, um, is it, so are you able to identify things that we might expect, like um, maybe uh, either the leader of those cliques or um, an ambassador between cliques uh, you know, reasonably reliably or things like that? Uh, so uh, two things. One, when you're trying to identify the people who turned out to be central. So we were partnering with a, a bank in terms of trying to get the microfinance information out. And their algorithm was to try and locate people that they thought was, were, were central. And the way they were doing that was looking for people that were teachers, self-help group leaders, shopkeepers, people they thought interacted with a lot of people. It turns out that in many villages, those weren't central people. And so identifying central people, you know, part of the technique we're using now is really to go in and ask and then snowball sample. So we ask somebody for somebody who's central, then we ask those people, they tend to be even better at naming central people, and then you can quickly um, triangulate on them. In terms of sort of identifying, you know, the, um, the, the clusters and who the people are that go across them, they tend to form, there, there's sort of two extreme groups that, that are people who are big connectors. Um, so one type is a type who's actually an outcast. So in some cases, you'll find a widow. In, in Indian villages, being a widow without actually being part of a family is, is really tough. And you'll find some of them sort of falling between the cracks and then reaching out across groups. And then you also find some people who are, are the, the major political figures or connectors in the villages, depending on the politics. It depends on which village you're looking at. But some of them actually reach across the the aisle. Um, and, and those people, there's a bunch of studies in science now that are looking at teams of people doing research uh, and, and finding that the people who are actually those connectors tend to often have the most creative and innovative work. And so that there's, you know, there's actually rewards to it. But they, they come from sort of both sides of the, you know, people who are doing really well and people who are doing really poorly. And it depends on the context, I think, as to who those connectors are. In, in the book, I actually spend time talking about the Casibo de Medici and sort of how he engineered the rise of the Medici in, in Florence. And he was a person, it's amazing. When you look at that graph, he looks pretty much like a star graph. I mean, he was really connecting a lot of other people who weren't connected. And that was part of the, the key to his political clout. Um, and and he, you know, they rose even though they weren't the wealthiest or most politically powerful family. But that, that network position was really instrumental. Thanks a lot for having me.